Hey folks, Dave from Nardarchy, for Nards, by Nards, and today I'm hanging out with Keith Baker here at Gen Con, and we're going to be talking about Ebron for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Jump down in the description below where you can find Nardarchy the newsletter, game weekly tips, as well as learn how to game with Nardarchy. So I got Keith Baker here, we're going to talk about Ebron, just recently released in the GM's Guild. So if you just want to say a little bit about who you are and where people can find you. Uh, so I'm Keith Baker. I'm best known for creating uh, the setting of Eberron and the card game Gloom. Uh, at the same time, I have my own company, Together Studios, inconveniently spelled T-W-O Gether, <laughs> just to mess with you. Uh, and you can find that on togetherstudios.com. Uh, we're Together Studio, I think, on Twitter. Uh, and I myself am HellCowKeith on Twitter uh, and Keith-Baker.com. And we'll get some links in the description. Yeah, People always are like asking questions about Eberron, how do I play Eberron, even before they finally released. And I'm like, well, there's this guy that knows a little bit about it. He does, he's got a website where he's always writing about it. You might want to look there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So um, your campaign setting, the one that you created for the contest for Wizards of Coast, you beat us, bastard. <laughs> um, Me that, all four keys. Exactly. But you know, it was actually, when it came out, we're like, oh, yeah, that's why. Um, it's actually one of the few campaign settings I actually run any game. I have not played in any pre, or I have not ran, ran any pre-written campaign settings for any version of Dungeons and Dragons. It's the only one that really appealed to me, other, some of, other than some of the outliers. But for actually running a campaign, that was the first one. And even when 5th edition came out, mm -hmm. I ran uh, probably like three to five one-shots, you know, based out of, based out of Sharn. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the Ever Everon campaign setting, it just speaks to me for some reason. I don't know why. There's just so much there. It's unique. Like, um, you know, we kind of, we, we're, we're a little hard on the Forgotten Realms and Greyhawk because it's like, if we're going to play generic fantasy, we're like, we might as well just make up our own. And Everon brings something different to the table. So how excited are you to be finally back in working on your baby? Well, it speaks to me too, but it whispers at night and I can't get it out of my head. Um, I am super excited. And I mean, basically, uh, what I like to say is it's like, well, I never actually left Everon, you know? And, and all through, ever since 5th uh, edition came, you know, while it was still in playtesting, I was, I was poking wizards being like, so, so Everon, how about Everon? Yeah. Uh, it's actually been crazy these last couple months because I have been working on it and working on the Wayfinder's Guide and, and haven't been able to tell anyone because they wanted to do this. We're just going to release it. Surprise! Here's Eberron! And so it's been pretty crazy having to sit on it, uh, you know, while still wanting to talk with people and answer Eberron questions. You know, I do things online all the time, but I couldn't be like, but it's coming out tomorrow, you know? So... Uh, for me, the most exciting thing, honestly, is not just that it's in 5th edition, but that they have made it an unlocked option for the DMs Guild, which does mean anybody can write material for Eberron. And that's the thing to me, is there are definitely things I have been waiting 14 years to finally get to address a particular topic, to talk about the planes, to look at the goblins, and the fact that not only can we return to Eberron, but we can actually dive into some of the things that never really got explored uh, before is extremely exciting. What's on the top of your list to dive into? Uh, so like, I mean, a couple things, it's, I mean, there's so many things, but like the things that I'm like, I've always wanted to talk about this and never had the chance. The planes are one. And the point to me of the planes of Eberron is Eberron has always had a unique cosmology, but never really explored enough for people to do anything with it. Now, I want to write about them, but I'm not just interested in planar travel, because that's really generally a higher level character sort of thing. To me, it's more about how do the planes affect or interact with a story? Because in Eberron, you have manifest zones, which are places where the sort of influence of a plane blends through. You have coterminous periods where the influence of a plane you know, goes stronger or weaker and that affects the world. So I'm saying in something like Shavarath, the plane of war, 
I want to talk about what is that actually like if you go there and what is it like, but I'm also like, even if you're first level characters, you could wander into a Shavrath Manifest zone and what's that like? Or what would drive the campaign if we say, well, we're going to have, you know, to me, you think of winter in Game of Thrones where we're mm -hmm. like, winter is coming. Coterminous periods should be like that. If we say once every 50 years, we have a year of coterminous with Shavarath, and that causes tensions to rise and things like that, people should be preparing for that. You know, that these are interesting elements that you could work into a story that, again, have always been part of the world, but we've never really told you about them. So, planes is one thing. I am interested, and this came up in the talk I did at, uh, at here when I was asking people what they want, doing a little more about the role of magic in the world. One of the things that's unique about Eberron is that magic is part of everyday life. Uh, you have things like airships, like the you know communication, warfare, and I'd like to delve a little deeper into what does that actually look like? You know, more examples of common magic items, more examples of exactly if you go to a Jurasco healing house, what do they, what do, they do? more details on airships. Like, you know, these sort of things that just add a little more hooks for people to play with. A uh, couple other high-level things, goblins and orcs, very different in Eberron than in some other settings. I'd be interested in exploring those. Dargoon. A Dargoon. For sure. Uh, yeah, definitely Dargoon, the Dakani, uh, and the different aspects of that. And the Dakani in particular is something I've always wanted to write more about, but there's just never been a good chance. And Droam is the other one, which is the Nation of Monsters that again, because it's a very different uh, approach to monsters in D&D, I'd like to explore that in a little more depth. Um, so those are definitely like just high level personal, these are things I've wanted to write for a long time. I'm also, I am personally right now, one of the campaigns I'm running uh, is in Seton Kabara over on the East Coast uh, and it's Basically, people who have a small stake in a dragon shard mining town uh, on the frontier, and it's very much essentially Deadwood and Eberron. And, and so it's the sort of fantasy western. And I'm having a tremendous amount of fun with it, and so something that just is a little bit of uh, exploring, we've got the pulp, we've got the noir, let's look at the Eberron western, uh, you know, off on the, the edge of hope. And that's something that I might do that would actually be like a little campaign primer, if you will, for writing so, that. So that's one of the cool things about Eberron is Eberron allows you to pl tell so many different types of stories and, and that's one of the things that I've really in enjoyed with it, you know. And I also like the, the one shots that I've been able to run with 5th edition and that, you know, I love like telling those stories and I was kind of inspired by the novels that I've read where it's like the players won but they walk away feeling kind of empty and hollow inside. <laughs> and it's something I never really experimented with before. One of the things to me uh, that I really like in the Wayfinder's Guide uh, is I have a section on Sharn. And it's you know, a 30 page section on Sharn. And what I didn't want to do with the Wayfinder's Guide in general, what I didn't want to do is just redo the same stuff you've seen in third and fourth. If you've, you know, it's a book for people who have never played before, but it is also for people who have played every edition of Eberron. And we don't want to just say, if you've already got the third edition source book, you already know this. And so while it revisits things, it does it very much in the sense of what does this mean for you? How can you use this to inspire a story? So I have a section, a page on Ondaer, but instead of going into the geography or things like that, it's about what does it mean to be a character from Ondaer? How do you express that? And so similarly in the Sharn section, I don't just re-go over everything in the Sharn source book because the Sharn source book is great and it's out there and if you want it, you got it. One of the things I do do is talk about uh, three different, what I call starting points of like here is a different kind of campaign you could run in Sharn and here's sort of the kinds of characters, the kinds of stories. So I have the Kalistan campaign, which is basically Gangs of New York in Sharn you know, sort of gritty, down in the worst part of town, your people who are down and out and don't have anywhere better to go. Uh, I have Clifftop, which is the Indiana Jones, your established adventurers that like people know your name and they want you to go find their thing. 
uh, and then in between Morgrave University, which is essentially in the, to a certain degree, you know, blend of Harry Potter and Name of the Wind. It's, you know, you are students at a school of adventuring and your field trip is going to take you to giant ruins in Zendrick. Uh, and part of the point of those is there are three completely different kinds of stories. And it's saying, do you want a gritty, you know, dark uh, down in the, the worst parts of the town? Do you want to be globetrotting adventurers? Or do you want to try something completely different and actually, you know, play this coming of age in college in Sharn sort of stories? And Eberron can do them all. You know, that's one of the strengths of, of that setting is being able to, to, to play any kind of story you want to. Um, and, it, you know, the other thing, too, like, like I kind of mentioned, like, you would think that players would kind of not like the fact that if you tell a story and they do everything right and, and they kind of win, but at the same time, it's that noir feel. But you know what, they, I think they really get into it because it pulls on their emotions and they're like, oh man, you really made me feel something with that. It was actually really funny. I, I get into a uh, uh, sort of little behind the scenes thing. This was a point of argument in um, the first module I wrote, uh, Shadows of the Last War, that at the, how I originally wrote it was at the end uh, it's absolutely the Belloc scene from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Emerald Claw shows up and basically takes your stuff. Uh, and the whole point to me was to set up, you know, like in Raiders, this is setting up the next adventure where you're going to take your stuff back and you're going to get revenge. And, you know, it's the having a loss is a way to build up the now I hate that villain and I'm going to mm -hmm. make them pay. Uh, whereas if you just always win, 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 uh, you don't have the drama. And, and this really comes back to my other role-playing game, Phoenix, Dawn Command, which I made recently. Part of the whole drive of Phoenix is that in Phoenix, death is how you grow stronger. Uh, you can come back up to seven times, but only up to seven times. So each time you die, you level up essentially, but you're also getting closer to the end. But what it means is that death is not failure and it is not the end of the story. I don't have to shy back from having Belloc show up and kill you all and take your stuff because it's not the end of the story. You're going to make him pay. And it just allows a certain amount of freedom. It's, it's in Phoenix, I can stack the odds against the players in a way I wouldn't in D&D, in part because what it means is it drives you to do everything. It's Gandalf on the bridge at Moriah. That is not a fair fight. The Balrog will just kill them all if they try to stand and fight against it. It would be a jerk move to put that scene in a D&D &D game and just be like, why didn't you run? You should have run. Uh, and say there's no way you can possibly beat this thing. But in Phoenix, you can definitely say, there's a way you could beat this thing if one of you is willing to go down on the bridge with it. And, and I love those kind of moments where it's like you have to come up with a, with a solution that isn't just attack and hope the dice go your way. In Phoenix Dawn Command, mm -hmm. was, was that scene inspiration for you for part oh, of the mechanics? Oh, tremendously. Phoenix, you know, the point in Phoenix is that it was actually inspired by, of all things, a long-running Exalted campaign that my co-designer Dan Garrison was running that I was in. Uh, and we had this game running for about a year and I had to leave town, I was moving, and we decided rather than just have my character, you know, be an NPC or sit around, me and him said, well, let's have like a huge going out, I'm gonna like take on the big bad guys and, you know, achieve something but die in the process, which none of the other players understood that we were doing this, so they were just like, oh my God, what happened? Oh, you know, I was totally in on it. But basically that was such an awesome story moment that we're like, well, why can't we, we have that more? And so to me, Gandalf on the bridge is absolutely, it's such a great moment. You know, you also think of 300, you know, you think of these things where moments of sacrifice are compelling stories. Uh, and Gandalf is the perfect example there because it is literally like a Phoenix thing of in Phoenix, you do come back, but you don't come back right away and you don't come back where you died. So within the context of them getting out, well, they've still lost him. He's gone at that point. They've got to keep going. He comes back in a couple chapters and now he's leveled up and that's great. But again, it's not that death is meaningless. It's that you have to decide, is this worth it? Is this the time where it is worth it to me 
to, to make the stand on the bridge, even if I'm going to be, uh, you know, if, if you've got to go the rest of the way without me. Right. And in that game, you can only come back so many times, seven, I believe. And, and that's the interesting point of, again, what we did is we took the worst thing in D&D, which is death, and combined it with the best thing in D&D, which is leveling up. Uh, and so in some ways you want to die because it makes your character better, but at the same time, because you only get to do it seven times, as you get more power, you have to start being more responsible and careful with it. Um, and, and there's, I mean, I could go on about Phoenix forever, you know, there's all sorts of interesting yeah. things I like. And it's just, it lets you tell a different kind of story than I would tell in, uh, in D&D. And people have asked, could you move it to Eberron? Uh, and in fact, I posted something on my website about how I would use it in Eberron is I would absolutely uh, run a campaign set when, uh, in the Empire to Come when they're fighting the Dalkir. And because the whole thing about Phoenix is you, you need to have a conflict that is worth dying for. You know, they're not just adventurers trying to make money or go down to a thing. It's you need to feel like this is legitimately worth, you know, everyone has a stand. cause. Everyone has a cause. You know, what I say is it's a war story. You know, I like to say to me, it's like if you take the TV series Rome and you mash it up with Pacific Rim and World War Z. And you're like, you know, we're in a sort of uh, medieval sort of basic concept, but we are facing a world-threatening uh, host of terrors that we don't even understand. And it's worth anything. And so go back to Eberron and the Empire of Dakan facing the forces of Zoriat, and we don't understand them, and this could destroy our world, that that's a perfect place. To, uh, to throw a team of goblin phoenixes in Now, Netflix. when I was in France uh, playing D&D in a castle, I actually got a chance to get you know, play, not a full game, but more of a primer. It was enough mm -hmm. to give me a feel for it, which I liked it. I liked the card management and resources. It was a lot of fun. Uh, James Intercosta was actually the one that ran nice. it for us. I have to uh, thank him for that. And I, and I know Jeremy Crawford was actually trying to sneak in on a game at mm -hmm. some point or not, but it was pretty hectic while we were there. And I believe he also has some DM's Guild stuff coming out for mm -hmm. Eberron as well. Yes, he, he does, I'm sure. I think he's doing uh, like some adventures in Sharn. And, and that's the thing to me is, is I have to say, I don't, writing adventures is not my favorite thing uh, because my DMing style is very... Um, you know, very sandboxy, uh, very much respond to what the players come up with. You know, I have definitely a plot that's going to happen, but, you know, as I've said, one of my classic stories is you're in Greywall and Droam, you have 24 hours to find a wizard who's working on a body switch ritual. And my point is, I know the sort of various steps here, but I don't know how you're, what you're going to come up with to try and find it. It's like, how do you find a wizard in a haystack? And so when I'm running this, I've run this adventure 56 times, uh, and people have said, well, well, where can I get it? And I'm like, well, you can't, because I've never actually written it's it up down. Here. <laughs> I've written down the stats for the monsters. I've written down the things. But the actual, I sort of know the vague, this is how it will go. But I don't know what you're going to do in here. And for me to write down every possible thing that could happen, uh, you know, would just be this huge sort of book that just doesn't really work. And so, uh, so I'm, one of the things I'm really glad about with the DMs Guild is that people will be writing adventures and that there's going to be a lot of interesting options out there. Because like I said, that's definitely something that I personally, it's not high on my list of what I want to do. So do you have plans to do a lot of work in the DMs Guild? Uh, what, what can we expect from in the future for Eberron? I want to do as much as I can with the time that I have. And, and the main thing, I'm really excited about it being out in the DMs Guild uh, for exactly that reason. Um, and because there's things I've wanted to write about that uh, for 14 years now that I've never had the chance to. And so, you know, I want to write more about the role of magic in the world and just getting a little deeper. We've always said, you know, magic is an everyday thing. And we have examples, you know, the ever-burning torch, uh, glamour weave, you know, some things like that. But I want to actually talk a little more about what does that actually look like, especially now we have like the idea of common magic items, I mean, uncommon magic items. Let's get a broader range of those. We have some of them in the Wayfinder's Guide, but it's just a taste. Dragon Mark focus items, you know, what's the, the scope of those? 
uh, one of the things we get to in a little more detail in the Wayfinder's Guide that I really like is the idea of wand slingers, uh, which is to say that in 5th edition, with the role of cantrips, the idea of the character who basically fights with, with battle magic uh, you know, and I'm running a bit of a Western campaign, and having the the you know the warlock as the sort of one one slinging scoundrel sort of really works as an archetype there. And so again, playing up if you do that in um, the Wayfinder's Guide, you know, we added a little more. Here's a couple low level but still interesting different types of arcane focuses. Like, does it make a difference if you use a staff or a wand, and why? And uh, so so as I said. Something about just the role of uh, common magic and what does that look like. I really want to write about the planes uh, because we just never have, both in that sense of what happens if you go there, but more in the sense of how does it, how can they play a role in any story? Because in Eberron we have manifest zones where they touch the world, we have coterminous periods where the influence of the plane grows stronger. But again, we don't give you a lot of examples of what our manifest zones to Shavarath actually like. Uh, and to me, one of the big things I, sh I should say here is, and this is what I tried to do with the Way Wayfinder's Guide, is I do want to deepen the lore, but with any book I'm writing, I don't want it just to be like, this is an encyclopedia or a textbook. I always want, with any piece of lore, that question of how does this inspire a story? Why is this cool? What do you want to do with this? So it's not just, here's a plane of war. It's, why is it interesting? What could that, that do for you? So magic, the planes, I've always wanted to get a little deeper into the goblins and orcs of Eberron, just because they're very different uh, from in other settings. I've always wanted to do more with Droam, the kingdom of monsters, because again, it's a very different sort of approach to monsters than in many other settings. And that's just scratching the surface, you know. So basically for the past 14 years, you've been writing on your blog and thinking yes. things. I have two questions. Yes. One for the folks out there. Yep. How many of you would like to see Keith just go to his website and compile that stuff and put it over the DMs Guild so you can buy it? And the second one is, uh, is for you. Uh, which you may be able to answer or not. If you cannot, can't, that is fine. How closely will you be working with Wizards of the Coast on Eberron and going forward in the future? Well, I'm going to touch on the first one first because I'm curious about that. Is I have thought, you know, something that would be quite easy would just be, you know, my website. I'm very proud of all the work I've done, but it's not well indexed. It's not easy to just find a random article. And I have thought about should I just sort of do a best of, you know, here's my 20 favorite articles and just throw that up. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, I, I'm definitely interested in the answer to that question. Is that something people would like to see? Um, because it would be easier to use yeah. <laughs> than my website. As to the second, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, uh, the basic point about it is uh, Wizards worked with me on the Wayfinder's Guide and the whole idea is they want to see how do people respond to Eberron? Do people want more uh, to see more Eberron? You know, that's going to be reflected by sales of the Wayfinder's Guide. It's going to be reflected by what happens on the DMs Guild. You know, is there a surge of people writing cool, interesting stuff for Eberron? Uh, so I am reasonably confident that, you know, the idea is if Eberron does well, if people want more official Eberron content, then they will do it. And I am reasonably confident that if they do, that they'll work with me. I mean, again, they came to me to do the Wayfinders. You are Keith Baker, after all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but what I'm saying is, you know, that's the future remains unknown. Uh, but again, I really enjoyed working with them on the Wayfinders Guide. And I'm very excited that they have opened it up to the DMs Guild and that they're open to letting people explore their own stories. Uh, it is just a thing to me about Eberron that from the start, one of our sort of ideas is compared to something like Forgotten Realms, which was very much built on the sort of aggregated canon of decades of novels, uh, that with Eberron, we've always wanted to say, this is your setting too. We're giving you a framework, but it's, it's your world to, to sort of push which of these ways you want. One of the big examples is in uh, the Wayfinder's Guide, we give you sort of a, if you wanted to connect it to other settings, 
here's the path to do that, but you don't have to. We're not forcing them all together. We're just saying for those of you who want a way to get uh, between the multiverse, you can. So with you now able to put things on the DM scale, mm -hmm. it creates this, this interesting position if you're not actually working directly with Wizards of the Coast on things. If you're putting out things that maybe they have a little bit of different vision of where things go, is that, is that a concern for you? No, and I mean, that's one of the things I liked about the Wayfinder's Guide is, you know, they basically said with the Wayfinder's Guide, we want a book that is Keith's View of Eberron. And, and that's the thing I would say is I don't think that if and when they put out uh, the next 5e Eberron hardcover, it's not just going to be the Wayfinder's Guide because the Wayfinder's Guide is, this is, is my thing. And all along with Eberron, uh, there are things about it that are slightly different than I would do if it was entirely in my hands. Uh, and I do do differently at my table. Um, but what I like about the DMs Guild is I can do whatever I want. When an official book comes out, it may not follow that. And there may be good reasons not to follow that. But I love that the DMs Guild is going to at least give me the chance to sort of explore my Eberron. And then you people sense. at your tables, you can exactly. decide. And, and, and that's exactly right. Is, you know, that's the point is canon is a point of starting, but anyone, including me, including you, you make Eberron the, the, the final thing is going to be the way you want it to be. Awesome. I want to thank you for hanging out with me today. Real quick, uh, before we head out, let people know where they can find you. All right. So my personal website, which is where I write all this stuff about Eberron, uh, is keith-baker.com, K-E-I-T-H-baker.com. Put Keith Baker into Google. I'm at least in some of the top Keith Bakers. I'm one of the top Keith Bakers. And beyond that, I'm Hellcow Keith on Twitter. Uh, my company is Together Studios, and that's uh, Together Studio on Twitter. Yeah, we'll get some links in there. Thanks for watching. If you want to add to the discussion, let us know what you want to see from Ebron, from Keith, down in the comments below. While you're at it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, stay nerdy.